brought to you by Business Fights Poverty. Hello and welcome to Business Fights Poverty Spotlight Interviews. I am Katie Heisen, Director of Thought Leadership. Each week, these interviews provide you with the insights from a different perspective of Business Fight Poverty Network, giving you first-hand understanding of how businesses and others are working on some of the world's biggest social challenges. Today, I am joined by Joyce Mbeya Ikayo. She is the founder and CEO of Zidi, a digital learning platform contextualized for the African learner. Joyce currently sees over 12,000 people using the platform across six countries with clients such as Uber Kenya. She is an experienced entrepreneur and the star of the TV show The Apprentice Africa in 2008, being one of only three to represent Kenya. She's written books on personal development and now she's on a mission to empower Africans, particularly women. Joyce says, I believe in people, more specifically in their potential I see each person and I see possibilities, their possibilities. So Joyce, welcome. Hi, I'm grateful (laughs) to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me to this podcast, Katie. I'm looking forward to it. Great to have you, Joyce. My first question today, you're Mm -hmm. the founder of Zidi, a platform Mm -hmm. connecting you with online courses tailor-made for Africans. How did this come about? Well, I've always had a, a passion. I actually left my fantastic corporate job here and sort of went on this interesting path where I chose to follow my purpose and chose to follow my calling, which I did is to empower other people. And this is something I realized that comes naturally to me. And of course, there's a whole longer story as to how that happened, which I won't talk about today because of time. But yeah, so along this journey where I was a trainer and I wrote my own book and I was sort of on this path, just speaking and training and empowering others. I eventually got to the point where I realized that the only way to grow this vision, right, beyond me as an individual and be able to impact thousands or maybe even possibly millions more would be to develop a platform. And also at the same time, I realized the importance of technology when it comes to time, because of course, as I was on this amazing journey where I would travel, of course, anybody who's a trainer will tell you that a lot of it is travel because you're moving from one place to the other where your client needs you to speak or to train. And so I was actually on the move quite a bit, sometimes not just in Kenya, but all over Africa. And it reached a point where once I got married and of course had kids, which I know a lot of parents would relate to, it's just not the same. I wanted time to be home. I had to be home a lot with the kids. So naturally, a lot of my physical you know, events and speaking engagements slowed down. And so it was... um also a big moment for me to realize that I had to change the way I was delivering this, you know, the way I was reaching people. And again, technology made a lot of sense. So if I could put my own courses online, then it didn't matter if I wasn't able to physically attend. And then realizing that I'm not the only one with this problem. And so it's better for me to develop a platform that not, it's not just for myself, it's for anyone else like me who wants to train people online. And then more importantly, I chose to focus on African women because this is the group that I'm a part of. This is my own reality. And I know the specific challenges we face when it comes to getting the skills we need. So all this stuff kind of came together and that's what inspired ZD, like being able to build this platform and specifically choose to focus it on African women as well. And Joyce, 2020 has so far seen the COVID pandemic and a global uprising in the response to George Floyd's very sad murder. Mm. What has this meant for you personally and for your business? First of all, I think it's, it's interesting that if you look back to where we were last year, right, I don't know if any of us could have comprehended the magnitude of a pandemic like this, that not just one country or a few countries, but all over the world, people having to be home. There's, there's the normal way of life, right, which is the, I get up, I go to work, and there's this whole capital corporate, I guess, life or work life that a lot of us are used to, our regular amenities, our coffee shops, or I'm going to go out for lunch with my friends. What has been interesting for me is just to observe the whole, the whole normal, you know, the whole way that we think life should be being turned upside down. But because I'm, um, I'm sort of, as you can tell, I'm in the space of empowerment. I'm a reflective person. I read a lot. I'm also spiritual. So for me, it's also been reflection about how, even when we think it's impossible, to shift the way we do things, it's 
when we're pushed to the corner, we can, right? So for example, a lot of people would have said, oh yeah, of course people should work from home, but we don't think that, you know, a lot of large companies would say, yeah, but it's not, we don't think that it's going to work or we can't allow everybody to work from home. And then all of a sudden, because of COVID-19, well, everybody's working from home, you know? And because people had no choice, there's a lot of things that seemed impossible that we are sort of being forced to innovate. And, and for me, that's the positive aspect of it. It's, it's not easy. It's definitely painful. And I'm so sorry for the families that have been affected. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying that in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the, of the struggle that the pandemic has brought, personally, for me, it's also been a time of, maybe that's my nature, <laughs> just to see, yes, it's hard, but then what's the positive, right? What's the, how can we spin this for the greater good? Because that's all we can do, you know? We can't, if it has happened and we can change it, the only thing we can do is evolve with it and look at how we can shift so that we can be able to live our lives even in the reality of what the pandemic has done. So for my business as well, it has been pivoting. By pivoting, I mean, of course, like any other business, we've had our challenges, especially on the B2B side. And it's forced us to stop and sort of ask ourselves, if we want to survive as a business, what do we need to do differently? So we're launching new products. We've tried to create products that make sense for the pandemic. For example, the educational side has been affected. So we found ourselves launching, you know, classes on formal education for students in Kenya who are at home. This was not an area that I was addressing, but because I have the technology to address it with ZD, we chose to do this so that we can make a difference during this time. Maybe another example would be changing the way, like for example, we were doing a lot of video production. We also realized that's not possible because we are social distancing, we're at home. So we figured out all these interesting different ways that we can still create courses, even though we're not doing any production work, like recording from home, recording on our phones. And it's amazing that we can actually do that. And it makes me think that sometimes there's so many different ways to execute something, but you may not see it unless you're pushed against the wall, right? Yeah, so that's speaking to COVID-19. But now the bigger question you've asked, which is even more intensive, I guess, would be George Floyd. Wow, I don't even know. There's so much I could say about this. The first thing I'll say is that the, the way it happened and the way it caused um, an uprising globally, for me personally, I think it was just a recognition of the, how a cause, how do I put it? how something that's so painful and so sad can bring humanity together. And it's, it's as, it was unexpected, I'll say that for sure. I think we've had a lot of these um, issues around, um, I'll say, race happened before. But it was, I don't know if it's because of the timing, but this, has been, this was interesting to see how people actually empathized and came together around, around this and the conversations that have happened as a result. And I can tell you, even for us here, we're not in the U.S., but we're affected by similar issues. I have to be honest about that. And there have been interesting conversations happening even around the history we have, for example, in Africa with colonialism and how it has affected us. I mean, my point is maybe these conversations wouldn't have sparked or everybody was sort of okay with the status quo until George Floyd. And that's something that maybe we'll always be grateful to him and his family for, despite the loss of his life, which happened. But it's Oh, I don't even have the words to say. It's just sparked something and a debate and a conversation that is so important and may not have happened without the global uprising that caused it. I hope I'm making sense. It's, <laughs> it's such a heavy topic. I think we need a whole other hour just to discuss it, you know. And Joyce, there are lots of calls to rebuild better, to make sure that we don't kind of go back to status quo after this, well, crazy first six months of 2020. Mm. What would you like to see happen? Like I said, I think now that we've all realized that, for example, there's, there's a different way of doing things. One of the things I would say I'd like to see happen specifically is a lot of parents, a lot of people are working from home. And it's good that this has been embraced as the new normal. I think I'd like to see this continue. But more importantly, I'd like to see more support for parents specifically. And that's what I think a, a great lesson that the pandemic has taught us. So a lot of organizations now, I'd, I'd like to see that recognition and support for working parents that has been talked about a lot and different um, solutions suggested. But now I see a chance to really put action to it. For example, 
maybe if people do end up going back to the usual, you know, working from the office, maybe now it's employers need to be more understanding about allowing parents to work from home or allowing people to have a flexible schedule. This is something, the flexi schedule has been debated so much and it seems like such a hard thing for so many companies to do. And now it's, we know it's possible. So now I would like to see that be accepted as the reality instead of going back to the old way of doing things. And what I would also like to see happen, and, and this is something that is based on what has already happened, especially again, speaking to Black Lives Matter, um, one of the things that has been happening as a trend here in Kenya, and I'll share this very openly because it's the truth, is that a lot of the funding, external funding that's come into the startup ecosystem here has predominantly favored, um, and allow me to be, I don't know which other word to use, but I'll say foreign founders, or should I say white founders? That's been a, something that's been such an issue. I mean, I can tell you, it's been a, actually a cause that's been rising here, but there hasn't been a clarity as to how to address it. Of course, there's a lot of debate about why it might be happening and, and you know, sort of conversations. But what has happened with Black Lives Matter, I can tell you here, is that it has sparked a very interesting, can I say pushback? So whereas before, you know, there would be conversations and, you know, it was discussed at a, a sort of a high level. Now I'm seeing actual movements. I'm seeing petition letters. I'm seeing, you know, people are trying to rally and actually have the difficult conversations of why is this happening and what can we do to change it? You know, in the, all of us who are part of the ecosystem. So that's already one thing I think that has happened partly because of COVID-19, but a lot because of the Black Lives Matter movement, inspiring all the same cause even outside of the U.S. because, right, you know, it affects, Black Lives Matter affects all the communities that are predominantly Black in one way or another. And so what I, that's what I would like to see happen. I would like this to be actionable. And I would like the conversations not to stop because I think they're happening now because of all this. And so when, again, when things do go back to some sort of normal, I would hope that this then doesn't just become a passing way, but we actually see real change and that whatever commitments have been made at this time are not forgotten. What do I think will actually happen? Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so for me, I would say what I like to see happen is what I hope will actually happen. <laughs> That's my nature. But I can't speak to that. I guess none of us really know. So we can only, I can only move by the hope and faith because I can't truly say what will actually happen, to be honest. Um, moving back to talking a bit more about um, ZD, your platform yeah. is all about skills. What do you think the top skills are for now and for the future? And, and why would that be? The first thing I would like to say, and I'm so glad you've asked this question, is I believe the future of work is multi-skilled. It sounds obvious, but I'd like to start by stating that. I think historically, a lot of us have been specialists, right? We go to school, we study a course in a certain area, and we tend to build our careers around that. And more and more now, I think, by multi-skilled, I mean, even if you study, for example, let me give my own example, actually. So I studied computer science and mathematics, so tech. You know, I'm, my background is IT. I thought I would have this career in the tech, technology and IT and anything related to that. And then ultimately, it turns out I have a talent, all right? I have a um, natural talent as a trainer. I'm good at speaking. I'm good at empowering people. I love to do it. It brings me to life. It's my passion, right? But that's a different skill. I've actually had to learn that skill and build it. It's, it's, I may have the natural talent, but of course, unless I worked on the skill, then I wouldn't have been successful as a trainer. So that's a second skill, right? And then now I'm doing ZD. It's e-learning. I've realized instructional design is a different skill. This is how do you translate training programs into online courses? That's a whole other skill. So you see, I've already named multiple skills that I have had to have naturally because of shifting my career path. But I think this is the normal for all of us now. We need to ask ourselves, even if I have this one career that I'm following, what are the alternative skills that I can build in order to be relevant for the future? What are the complementary skills that I can add on that would increase my value to my employer, to my business? So it needs to be the new normal that we all cultivate multiple skills and be very intentional about that as well. Top skills, I think the first one is, how do I put this? I don't, I can't speak to it specifically, but I would say technology. When I say that, I mean, each of us has a different way that we can incorporate technology into our work. 
For example, right now, as you're doing the podcast, Katie, this is a skill, <laughs> learning how to do a podcast and you, you are cultivating that as part of your work. So that's what I mean. So I think any skill related to tech, it could be not necessarily coding, but it could be more of understanding technology and innovation as a skill. So if I'm, I have a particular job that I'm doing, where is the role of technology in my job, right? And how do I, how do I become effective at translating that? I hope that makes sense. You know, it's hard for me to be specific because it could apply in so many different ways. But I'd say it, it, as technology and innovation in itself as a skill is going to be a must, especially with what we've seen with COVID-19. The second skill I'd say is, especially because a lot of us are doing remote work, I think, I think there's a higher level of people skills and emotional intelligence as a skill. And I say that because I truly believe that this soft skill is so, if, you're, if you have a high EQ or you're very good at dealing with people, you can handle a lot. You can handle anything actually. And so it's not, a, I don't think it's optional for us anymore because I think when you're working in a physical space with people, to be honest, I think there's a lot you can sort of get away with. You can be in your space and do your work. I hope that makes sense. And you don't have to do, you don't, may not have to do as much around, well, you do need to do a lot on people engagement, but I'm just trying to say you could sort of be in your corner and do your work. I think remote work is actually harder in the sense that your skills around dealing with people are tested even more when you have to be dealing with people virtually. So I think this is something that we all have to work on a lot more because now having to do, to be a good team player, you know, to be a good leader, anything you do around people is twice as hard when you have to do it virtually. So we all have to have this skill because this is the future. We're going to be doing a lot more things virtually. So we have to build on that. The third skill I think would be productivity. I know it sounds weird to say, but I'm speaking again to the fact that we are working remotely. There's a lot of self-management required when you work remotely. There's a lot of productivity skill. How you structure your day, how you accomplish your tasks within a given time. I think when you when you have a structure where you show up at the office, you do your job and you go home, it's easier to be productive. When you're working from home, it's harder to be productive. There's so many distractions, you know, all this stuff happening around you. And so I think all of us, a big skill that we are all going to have to cultivate very intentionally is productivity. So I think learning frameworks, learning, you know, how to be very effective and productive, how to do more in less time. So I would say, just to recap, I think I said technology, I said people skills or emotional intelligence, and then I said productivity. And as a young female Kenyan entrepreneur, what would be your advice to other aspiring entrepreneurs? Oh, these questions are packed. (laughs) like so much I can say. I would say believe in yourself, first of all. Why I say that is because personally, my experience, especially during this time, this, we're being tested in a way we've never been tested before. Like if, even if you are, had some marginal level of success or your business was rising and doing well, all of us have been affected by, by the pandemic, right? So the biggest advice, because what I've seen happen is that even to me, the first thing that's affected by everything is my, should I say my self-esteem or my belief in myself? It's tough when you're losing your team, when you're watching your business numbers going down. There's so much coming at entrepreneurs right now. So it's very easy to give up and just think, oh, I'm not good at this or I'm messing up. I'm not, I'm failing. You know, I'm not doing anything right. And to be able to rise up and overcome all the challenges that we are facing the biggest thing is we really have to believe in ourselves. You have to believe in your vision. You have to believe in your purpose. You have to be driven by something greater than, I don't know, your bottom line, even if it's important, because that's what's going to get us to keep going in the face of so many challenges that we're facing. So I spend a lot of time, the books I'm reading now are a lot about intrinsic motivation, you know, believing in myself, I'm learning how to tap into my purpose because This is the attitude that's helping me, despite even if my physical circumstances are tough, you know, my revenue, my finances are suffering. It's the deeper stuff that you reach for inside that can help you to overcome that and still keep going and show up and show up every day and keep doing your work, believing that things are going to turn around. So that's the advice I would give. Just believe in yourself and believe in your vision and and take time to work on yourself and your purpose because Having that inner strength is what is going to keep you going. It's not the external circumstances. Yeah. 
And my final question today, Joyce, for anybody who's listening to this podcast, what would be your call to action? It's to embrace the, the challenges that we're facing. You know, I think it's very easy to, to be defensive, right? And to keep analyzing, why is this happening? What are we going to do? What's the new normal going to be like? And the debates are fine, but I think I would still say the same thing that my call to action for anyone listening is take a moment and ask yourself, how are you going to use this opportunity now, you know, or this time now, whatever we are going through, all of us globally as the world, how are you going to use this to achieve your purpose? How are you going to use this to tap into the true purpose of why you're here? The other thing I'll say is that there are people who've lost their lives during this pandemic, which is extremely sad. And so for me, in those situations, I always say, you know what? There are people who haven't survived, but I'm still here. Take, take advantage. So do the same thing. You know, think about the fact that you're still here. And what does that mean, right? What are you going to do with the time that you've been given? You know, and how are you going to make the most of that so that you have an impact so that when you look back, that you know that you did everything possible to do your best with the time that you've been given on this earth, right? And so that's my call to action to everybody. It's let's stop. Let's, let's all take a moment to, to kind of reconnect with why we're here and to do the best we can for each other and for ourselves. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> oh, well, Joyce, thank you so much for sharing your wise words and your insight. Um, it's been very humbling to listen and um, lots to learn from you. All right. Thank you, Katie. And if you like what you've heard today, please do rate and subscribe to us. I would also love to hear your feedback. So please do drop me a line at any time. I'm Katie at businessfightspoverty.org. Many thanks. Brought to you by Business Fights Poverty. 